All right. Um, I will do my best to keep this to not much more than an hour. Um, no, we have any time you wish. You I know, know we do, but I, look, let's, we'll see how it goes. But that's my end. Greg, Greg we we'll have stayed about discuss. two and a half hours with us. Yeah, we can discuss forever. We can discuss forever. <clears throat> okay, as I think Gerhard probably explained to you all, this talk is about my forthcoming book, which is currently um, in the copy editing stage, should be published next spring. The book is called In the Shadow of the Gods, the Emperor in World History. It is about a job, and even more, it's about the people who did the job. Uh, the job was ruling empires, so the people are emperors. In one sense, this is a collective biography, and it's a collective biography of important and often fascinating individuals. One way I tried in the old days on Trinity High Table to explain what I was up to, particularly when sitting next to science, natural scientists of one sort or another, was to say to them that they conducted experiments on materials under extreme heat, cold, etc. Um, essentially, my book was doing the same to human beings. Um, you know, being an emperor was not an easy job uh, for all sorts of reasons, some of which I'll have time to talk about. So one is looking at human beings operating under extreme pressures of one sort or another, pressures, temptations, all sorts of things. Another way of looking at the book or a different aspect of the book, I mean, both are true, is to think of it as the anatomy of a specific type of political system hereditary imperial monarchy. Remembering that actually for most of world history, hereditary monarchy and even hereditary imperial monarchy have been the most frequent type of polity probably. A third way of looking at the book, another aspect of what it is to put things rather pompously, is that it is a sort of study of leadership. In a sense, it's also a book which tries to answer, to the extent one ever can answer, that old conundrum about the relationship between structure and the individual, uh, you know, the role of the individual in history. An emperor by definition uh, is someone who is enmeshed in structure, he is also, by definition, an individual. There is, at the core of the project, inevitably and deliberately, quite a sharp tension. You know, this is a book which covers the emperor in world history from the first empire, in other words, the empire of Sargon of Akkad, down to the 20th century. It also covers the entire globe in principle, Though in practice, I don't really look at the New World or Sub-Saharan Africa before the European colonial era. Nevertheless, that is an awful lot of history to be, you know, having to cope with. To cope and make any sense of such an enormous scale requires comparisons, conceptions, generalizations. It requires structure. Biography, on the other hand, by definition, is about the individual and the individual is unique. And so there is this tension running through and as I say, quite deliberate and I think on the whole fruitful. It is a, it is a you know, tension which is also there to some extent in methodological terms. I mean, one of the great points about biography is that as you might say, it appeals to part of our natures which um, are our understanding. Uh, which rather dry structural analysis can't touch. In other words, it appeals to empathy, to imagination, even to some extent to the senses. Uh, so that although I'm about the least postmodern historian it would be possible to imagine, there is in that biographical approach uh, something which doesn't go beyond the realms of history as I understand it. Um, I am attempting to say things which I believe to be true or at least plausible and to back them with evidence. Nevertheless, 
there is inherently a certain tension in the methodologies you need for deep, uh, you know, deep structural analysis on a global five millennia scale and the kind of understanding of individuals. All right. That's all I'll say. That's just my initial little introduction. Um, <clears throat> perfectly obviously, 70 minutes is not at all adequate to try and talk about such a vast project. You know, when I wrote my 500 page book, uh, I felt that every sentence required a, a paragraph and every statement required a qualification and a nuance and this and that and everything else. You know, when I gave my six lectures for an American sort of graduate summer school about a month ago, even then I felt I was squashing down an already squashed book. Now I've just got 60 or 70 minutes. So obviously there's going to be far more left out than is here. <clears throat> what I'm essentially going to do is talk more or less uh, about chapter one in the book, which really sets out the essential features and challenges of the job of being emperor, and then gives some sense of how rulers responded to those challenges. Emperorship was really built around four key elements. Firstly, the emperor was a human being. Secondly, he was a leader. Thirdly, he was a hereditary monarch. And fourthly, he was the ruler of an empire. And essentially, this talk is built around those four elements, which I'll take in that order. And right at the end, I will make brief comments as a sort of conclusion about how difficult the job of an emperor could be and also about why emperors matter, including matter even to the world as we know it, in which there is only one emperor left, the emperor of Japan, and he doesn't actually matter very much. But nevertheless, some of the decisions made by emperors, sometimes millennia, let alone just centuries ago, are still of enormous importance to our contemporary world. OK, so let's start off with what is, in a sense, the most banal common element among the people I'm studying, which is that they were human beings. And of course, in the overwhelming majority of cases, males. Um, all sorts of things you could say about human beings. One of them is that we live in what's sometimes called a life cycle, you know, childhood, adolescence, young manhood, old age. Well, each of those stages has even for us, ordinary mortals, specific characteristics. The child is vulnerable, needs protection, needs guidance. Uh, the young man often combines energy, assertiveness, perhaps insecurity, certainly inexperience, maybe bluster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Old age, as, as certainly I and a number of the other people listening to this, has its aspects too. Um, increasing tiredness, sometimes the memory is going, uh, sometimes we get more stubborn with old age, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have out of date ideas, particularly in eras which are changing, in which change is occurring rapidly. Well, each of these parts of the life cycle has dramatic implications if the human being in question is an emperor. Let us just start with you. Uh, childhood in which the sovereign emperor is actually incapable of exercising power is, of course, in the nature of things, the era of regencies. And regencies are sometimes fatal, uh, especially for newly minted dynasties without deep legitimacy and dynasties in which you do not have an absolutely built-in legal uh, system of succession. The Wicked Uncle is a trope in my book, as in the history of hereditary monarchy in general. So one could talk about that, and indeed I do in the book. I talk, if anything, even more about the impact of old age. 
on emperorship and on the stability of regimes. A, a very significant number of the dynasties I study go through crisis and sometimes indeed collapse uh, because of the problems of having on the throne an aging uh, and increasingly decrepit monarch. Um, all sorts of problems. I will just give you one little example. I could give you many, many, many. This is the Emperor Tang Xuanzong. Uh, he ruled, reigned from 711, common era, to 756. In other words, 45 years. Xuanzong, for the first 30, even 35 years of his reign, was an admirable ruler in all sorts of ways. By the time he'd spent 35 years on the throne, he was exhausted, uh, managing a complex administrative bureaucracy, adjudicating between aggressive and disputatious senior ministers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is an exhausting business. Xuanzang was getting very tired. He was fed up of politics and government. He was increasingly inclined to think about, to use the words his soul, is of course a misnomer, but to think about the afterlife and his great, you know, his place in the great scheme of things. He also, in the way, unfortunately, of many aging males, uh, found the elixir of youth in the arms of a beautiful young woman, in this case, someone called Yang Yuhuan, who increasingly came to dominate uh, certainly his private life and in the nature of emperorship, you can't divide private and uh, public life, really. Her cousin was installed as prime minister, and actually, as Xuanzang himself increasingly retreated from an active role in politics and government, he was essentially the chief executive officer of the government. And again, as is absolutely in the nature of politics, particularly in the politics of hereditary monarchy, um, Yang Yuhuan and her cousin, the prime minister, their faction increasingly took over more and more positions in government. Very, very frequent in the history of imperial hereditary monarchy. The problem here, though, was that among the other factions, and indeed the one they targeted most determinedly, was the empire's senior general. Given the fact that Xuanzang himself was clearly not going to live much longer and that he was not protecting people who belonged to other factions, this general essentially staged a coup d'etat or attempted to do so. A vast civil war began and the Tang dynasty never recovered. It shrank back from its enormous size in the 1740s to a sort of inner core round the capital over which the dynasty continued to exercise some authority very typical you know as the center implodes loses power in all empires its control over the periphery you know contracts well you know i mean fine what's the relevance of all this to us well there is a certain relevance because um in the first half of the 18th century the chinese and the islamic world are in competition to dominate central asia the chinese were already it seems on the retreat but An Lushan, this is the name of the general, his rebellion actually determines the fact, which remains true to this present day, uh, that Central Asia is part of Islamic civilization, not part of East Asian Chinese civilization. So again, this is one relatively small example of how a political crisis in the 750s that none of you have probably ever heard of actually still does resonate in its results, its effects down to the present day. All right, um, so I'm talking about human beings and about human nature, and there are all sorts of things one could say about that. Another very basic one seems simply being that we are sociable animals. Most of us need society, we need company, we need friends. It is a real question whether an emperor could have what you and I might describe as friends. It's not easy being the friend of someone who in many of these imperial monarchies could end your life with a flick of his fingers, um, and who was, in a certain sense, semi-sacred above all human beings. There are many it, tutors of heirs to the throne, of princes, who warn them that they never really can have true friends. 
not least because friends will try and misuse friendship in the cause of their own, you know, power, wealth, privilege, etc., 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 etc. And if friends were dangerous, uh, and again, this is a much repeated warning, mistresses, lovers were even more so, as Louis XIV warned his heir. You know, because of the natural wiles of women and the way in which a deep relationship of love and even sexual passion gave a woman enormous power over you, you had to watch it. Because if, if you didn't watch it, uh, within, you know, a relatively short time, as in the case of, uh, you know, Tang Xuanzong, you would find this woman, her relations and her network dominating government and dominating patronage, etc, etc, etc. Louis XIV, in his very, very interesting instructions to his son and heir, which are actually always misleadingly referred to, indeed he called them his memoirs, they're not, they're his private instructions for his son and heir as to how to be a good emperor. Um, he, he made the point, and it was almost the most basic point in the book, that under no circumstances must the emperor, the monarch, allow any other individual and least alone a mistress and their network to actually control the channels of information and patronage, which were the two pillars of effective monarchical rule. And that, again, is advice about a subject which you know, ripples right throughout my book. So am I claiming somehow that human nature is unchanging uh, over five millennia? No, of course I'm not. And least of all, am I claiming that the human intellect is unchanging? Just one tiny comparison. I could, again, go on about this forever. Uh, a comparison which might seem to you very bizarre and would certainly seem that way to most of my colleagues. Between Emperor Julian, this is Julian whom I was brought up to think of or talk about as the apostate, three six, reigned in, briefly in the 360s common era, he is the emperor who tries to uh, undermine the work of his uncle Constantine and push the Roman Empire away from Christianity and back to the ancient classical gods, particularly the Greek ones. And the comparison I'm making is between him and the Emperor Joseph II, the Habsburg Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor from 1765, uh, sole Emperor of all the Habsburg domains, 1780 to 1790. Now, in some ways, both in terms of their personalities and in some structural terms, actually, there are interesting similarities between these two men. In purely personal terms, they were clever, they were Julian more than Joseph, but both interest in ideas and the intellect, they both had uh, an impatient and sometimes even hysterical element in their personality. They were rare, though of course far from unique among hereditary emperors, in actually coming to the throne with a radical program of domestic reform at the top of their agenda. In Julian's case, this is to roll back Christianity. In Joseph's case, it is to implement the ideas of the radical enlightenment. And in both cases, their radical and ambitious domestic reform program was undermined by the fact that they simultaneously went in for an ambitious forward foreign policy and got embroiled in wars which wrecked their regimes, their rule. So there are these interesting and I think valid comparisons to be made. And yet, of course, in intellectual terms, in terms of their sort of culture, their understanding of, of the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they are divided by a chasm. And that chasm is called the scientific revolution of the 16th century, 16th, 17th century, and the enlightenment of the 18th century. You know, Julian is still living in the Neoplatonic world, Neoplatonic philosophy, ancient Greek gods and myths, etc. Joseph is living in the world created uh, by utilitarian and rational semi-secular arguments of the you know, last two centuries. Fine. 
that is all I will say now about the emperor as human being. In other words, my first section. Second section, uh, my emperors as leaders. Um, and I will, again, be very brief, in fact, even briefer, if anything. You know, in looking and working on these emperors, it was certainly useful for me to read both the autobiographies and the biographies of some contemporary presidents, prime ministers, etc., etc. It was also useful for me to read some of the usually business school let, uh, uh, literature about leadership. Um, most of it was not of much use to me. Um, there is a vast difference between being an emperor and being, you know, uh, a, a, an entrepreneur trying to sell three wheel cars to I don't know who. Um, but some of the literature was very relevant. One book I would certainly, one author I would certainly single out, is a man called Ketz to Fries. I'm not sure whether any of you have come across him. He is both a professor at INSEAD, the business school, I think, in Versailles, very good business school, a professor of leadership studies, essentially. He's also a clinical psychoanalyst and an active one. And, you know, among his books, uh you know you get a very clear sense of what it means to be a guru a sort of spiritual counselor and a sort of policy advisor how to do the job well for very senior ceos of big big you know corporations and if you read Ketz de Vries, uh, de Vries you can certainly find rather alarming parallels with some of the people I study. For example, and this is just one of a myriad of examples, you know, Cardinal Richelieu was in many ways the Quetz de Fries to King Louis XIII of France. And this was, you know, the case at a crucial moment in French and European history. Louis XIII's reign is a major step towards the French monarchy, France replacing the Spanish Habsburgs as the paramount power in Europe. And this imposed enormous strains on France and success or failure hung very much, among other things, on the delicate relationship, personal relationship between the ruler, Louis XIII and Cardinal Richelieu. Uh, and it was an extremely difficult relationship because Louis XIII was an extremely difficult man, just as some of the CEOs who Ketz de Vries des describes are in rather similar ways difficult. Richelieu was indeed Louis's guru. As a cardinal, he was also very, very much his spiritual advisor and made use of that, but he was also his great policy advisor and chief minister. The main difference, really, there are many differences, but the, the main one, actually, is that whereas Ketz de Vries's relationship with a CEO uh, may contribute to the rise or fall of a big international corporation, Richelieu's relationship with Louis XIII uh, is going to have fundamental effects on the vi viability of the French state and on whether France is going to displace the Spanish Habsburgs as the paramount power in Europe. In other words, there's just a great deal more at stake. If it's, I think, the case that Ketz de Vries and some of the other literature on leadership from modern business schools is indeed relevant, to my study of leadership. There is something in leadership which is semi-universal. It is also the case that some of the, the literature I studied, some of the, the memoirs, the letters, the memoranda, the su surviving uh, you know, writings of a minority of my emperors are actually very relevant indeed to students at business schools. Um, it's not an accident, for instance, that Machiavelli uh, is sometimes a set text uh, at one or two business schools. It's interesting that one of the most fascinating uh, 
works on emperorship by an emperor. This is the two long memoranda, almost booklets really, of the Emperor Tang Taizong. This is in the seventh century common era. Uh, are, were, were published, translated and published in English within the last decade as a guide to best business practice. You know, so things, there are things which come across. And again, you know, I could talk about this for an age. Just one example, again, I come back to Louis XIV's memoir simply because it is so good. He wrote for his son advice on, for example, how to manage your advisors and counselors, how to make decisions on the basis of full information, uh, how to retain the final word, it's, it's, you know, how to manage committees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and his advice is certainly one you'd find, I think, in most stock business school, uh, you know, works on leadership. For example, Louis says to his son, you must always reward criticism. You must reward those who give you advice they know you don't want to hear. You must reward those who take an opposite line to the consensus. You must punish flattery or at least never reward it. And as a little practical piece of advice, listen more than you speak. And in any committee, always speak last. Because if you've made clear in advance what your own views are, uh, it is quite remarkable uh, how most of your ministers and councillors will try and agree with you. And actually, in one of his memoirs, President Obama said exactly the same about running the White House in today's world. Now roll on to one of the last really great crises in which emperors mattered enormously. The July crisis of 1914, which leads to the First World War, which actually leads, if not to the full demise, to, then certainly to the fatal wounding of imperial hereditary monarchy as uh, an important political type of polity. William II had many, many vices. He was, apart from anything else, both arrogant and deeply insecure. He tended to bluster, to shout and to bully. He regarded criticism or different opinions often as personal insults to him. He, he was, he had his some better sides as well, but he was a, a difficult human being. His closest friend, Prince Eul von Eulenburg, once called him a tender child and gave advice to Bülow, who was about to become foreign minister and later became chancellor of Imperial Germany, um, that he must handle the Kaiser um, precisely as if he was a good, well-meaning, but extremely unstable and sensitive and vulnerable child. William would be a fatal person ever to chair a committee uh, because he never stopped talking himself. He blustered and shouted. He mocked people who took opposite positions to himself sometimes. Um, and bluster was usually then succeeded as the crisis blew up by retreat, panic, uh, loss of nerve, backing down. Um, and actually in July 1914, that is to some extent what happened. And having seen this many times before, most of the senior generals who had got used to William's temperament and his moods, took it that when the, the real crisis broke, the emperor would back down as he had before, there'd be no war. Um, indeed, William tried to do just that, but by then he had released forces which he could no longer control. I mean, that is a grossly distorted uh, and you know short description of one of the most complicated crises uh, in history about which even Squeaky Leaven has written a 500 page book. But there is some element there to the idea that Louis XIV's advice uh, tells one part of what went seriously wrong in Berlin in July 1914, with dramatic consequences. All right, so on to my third section. 
you know, the people I'm studying are not just human beings and they're not just leaders. They are hereditary monarchs. And I think perhaps the first thing uh, I ought to say is, or discuss, is how is it that a system of governance, which is so inherently absurd, is nevertheless the one that has dominated most of recorded history. Uh, you know, it is patently obvious to us that if you were trying to get the most competent person uh, to be the political leader of a society, you are not likely to achieve that goal uh, through hereditary chance, which is essentially uh, the principle of hereditary monarchy. Now, actually, not just the ancient Greeks, but also many ancient Chinese and even ancient Indian political thinkers, philosophers, were just as aware of the inherent uncertainties, risks, and absurdities of hereditary monarchy as we are. Why then, despite that fact, was hereditary monarchy the dominant form of polity in the ancient world and indeed down to the 20th century? I think there are a number of factors here and they are important to take into account when trying to you know, understand my subject. The first is that, to an extent, political thinking uh, for much of the pre-modern era is a branch of what you might call theology. You know, there is the fundamental belief that events on earth are determined, or at least permitted, by heaven, and that therefore propitiating heaven, in one sense or another, following heaven's Moral, guide, moral guidelines uh, is absolutely vital to the health and success of a polity. Uh, the hereditary ruler is, the hereditary monarch, is almost always, if a monarch and his dynasty is to last for any time, some version of a semi-sacred uh, leader. He is, at, in one way or another, and it takes different forms under the Chinese Buddhist Confucianist compromise to Islam, to Orthodox Christianity, to Latin Christianity, et cetera, et cetera. But nevertheless, at some, in some way, he is an intermediary between human beings and the heavens. So already one is talking about factors which simply don't really come in when one's talking about our contemporary world. Thirdly, since God, certainly in the Christian and Islamic conception, created human beings, to some degree there has to be an overlap between natural law, that law which is essential and natural to human beings, essential to their survival in society. There must be some overlap between that and divine law, uh, because we are God's creatures. Therefore, since it was virtually universally accepted that society needed some kind of powerful monarchical leader to survive, presumably monarchs were blessed by whatever version of God uh, or the gods, uh, you know, that particular society, culture, religious tradition accepted. On top of that, heredity dominated society. You know, father was succeeded by son, whether it was a carpenter or you know, whatever. So it is seemingly natural that the same should be true of the highest institution and position in the polity and in the society, which was the monarch. Um, you know, again, I, I don't need to go into this in detail. I mean, as what I've been saying suggests, there was a very strong prudential element in the overwhelming consensus in favor of hereditary monarchy in most societies, in most eras. It was usually accepted and almost always by the intellectuals, if you're going to misuse a term, who actually wrote political justifications, political tracts, that in the absence of a strong monarchy, society would disintegrate. Uh, whether one is talking about 
ancient Indian, ancient Chinese, early Christian, etc., etc., etc. You name it. Uh, the usual view is that the mass of the population, uh, of course, some even more than others, is incapable of reason uh, and should not be allowed to participate uh, in making decisions, political decisions for the community. On the contrary, they need a strong authority or they're likely to run amok and destroy society themselves and everything else in the neighborhood. On top of that, there is a real fear of anarchy among the elites. For example, any idea of elective monarchy is regarded as being you know, the open sesame for civil war among elites. Uh, and it is you know, worth remembering that support for powerful hereditary monarchy uh, comes not just from elites and not just from intellectuals, but also very often it is part of mass consciousness of politics. After all, it is ordinary people to misuse a term who suffer most if there is civil war among the elites, if there is foreign invasion, if public order breaks down, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the support for a strong, her independent, hereditary monarch who will keep the elites in order, adjudicate their quarrels, act as a supreme judge for society as a whole, and keep enemy invaders at bay is a theme which runs right through history. Of course, one can never say to what extent, you know, in X or Y or Z society, support for hereditary strong monarchy is deep in the hearts of the peasant masses. I mean, but it is perfectly clear uh, that this is a theme which runs through most of recorded history, you know, that there is quite a strong support for that. It is interesting that Joseph II, this is the late 18th century Habsburg emperor, I mentioned, his governor um, doesn't bother to go into highfalutin justifications for hereditary monarchy. Um, he doesn't even really invoke God. He simply says in a way which is, of course, typical of an enlightened age, that in practice, hereditary monarchy works best, which is why it is the predominant system of government. And he points, in the case of Joseph II, to the only two major non-hereditary monarchies in Europe, the Holy Roman Empire and the Polish monarchy, both elective, both in steep decline. And he points to, you know, etc. city-states. The Greeks are, the ancient Greeks, are really the one exception, the domination of political thinking by the idea of hereditary monarchy. You know, Aristotle, most famously. I mean, Aristotle actually explicitly expresses what in the 1990s and the 2000s we call the Washington Consensus. He doesn't just say that democracy is the best system um, and that it is inherent in living the good life uh, to be a citizen, uh, to be a full human being. I, you know, not winning, not the plebs. You need to be a, a citizen. Um, but he also says that if you have a sufficiently large number of what we would describe as educated middle class, class men in a community, democracy is the only system which is, which is viable, which is very much a sort of basic assumption of modernization theory, Washington consensus, you name it. But, 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 Aristotle stresses that, you know, the only polities in which democracy is viable are medium-sized city-states. So for the first time, we come across the question of scale, which again runs right through my book and which I will talk about later, of course, very briefly. Plato was much less enamored of democracy, even in medium-sized city-states than was the case with Aristotle. His conception of rulership by an elite of guardians, educated in the humanities and mathematics, trained to rule in the interests of the community, et cetera, et cetera, is an obvious major contrast uh, to Aristotle's ideas. I think the best and certainly the most important and the most lasting embodiment of 
the platonic idea in actual politics and governance are the Confucian bureaucrats of imperial China. And to some extent, I see the contemporary increasingly ideological as well as geopolitical uh, struggle between the United States and China as being really the struggle between Aristotle and Plato certainly much more than it's the struggle between capitalism and communism as you know is true obviously in the in the first cold war all right um so that is an introduction slightly lengthier than i wanted to hereditary monarchy but i think an important one what about certain key specifics of imperial monarchy hereditary imperial monarchy as a system of government. I can only, of course, pick out one or two which seem to me extremely important. The first is succession. You know, in all political systems, the transfer of political power between groups in a society over the generations is an extraordinarily important element of politics. And it is a moment when polities are vulnerable. Now, Contemporary democratic politicians obsess about elections and they obsess about opinion polls because elections and public opinion will determine their survival in office. They will determine the issue of succession. Now, as we all know very well, democratic systems differ greatly uh, in detail the difference between presidential and parliamentary systems. Even within parliamentary systems, the difference between electoral systems based on first past the post and various forms of proportional representation, et cetera, et cetera. You get very different outcomes. The same was true of hereditary monarchy. You know, uh, hereditary monarchy is of course rooted in biology you know, reproduction. But it made all the difference in the world uh, whether you were talking at one extreme about the dominant system in Europe, which was male primogeniture, absolutely fixed succession rules, and right at the other end of the spectrum, uh, what is sometimes called tanistry or even bloody tanistry. In other words, basically, uh, that the ruler's sons, or even sometimes his sons, his brothers, his uncles, and his nephews, uh, fight it out for the throne. And the one who comes out on top becomes the emperor. And there is a sort of sense that, again, since the gods, heaven, uh, does or does not allow things to happen on earth, if you win, it must be because God wants you to win. So there's this sort of providential element in all systems, however expressed in dogmatic theology in, in different ways. I mean, as you can see, um, the, the choice really here, not that it was ever, you know, an entirely free choice, of course, but the choice is between maximizing stability and maximizing competence. Perfectly obviously, if you have strict hereditary primogeniture as a system, uh, male primogeniture, um, the person who inherits the throne may be a numbskull, an idiot, or you know, he, he's likely to be of average ability by definition. On the other hand, you are far less likely to have civil war when the emperor dies, you know, a war between his sons. At the other end of the spectrum, someone who comes out on top in a competition for power is likely in both political and military terms to be able on the other hand, the instability caused by periodic civil wars and the constant jockey for the succession long before the emperor dies and avert civil war breaks out, of course, is deeply destabilizing and in certain cases can be fatal. If you look at, you know, the Tanistry end competition between at least the emperor's sons in both cases, by then, by the time they become empires, you know, the free for all between sons, brothers and nephews has gone out of the window. But even just, uh, you know, between the sons, the Ottomans and the Mughals uh, are very interesting cases of this. And it is indeed the case 
that at their prime, both the Ottoman and the Mughal systems, ruthless as they are, produce exceptionally able monarchs. In time, the Ottoman system evolves away from this. Firstly, you know, in other words, from overt competition and civil war, armed struggle between the, the emperor's sons to inherit the throne. Um, it evolves firstly into a system whereby essentially the emperor's eldest son kills all his brothers or favored son, usually elders, kills all his brothers, half brothers when coming to the throne. Um, and then evolves yet further to a system whereby he doesn't kill all his brothers, but they are all locked up in the so-called cages in the harem, from which they are only extracted um, when they are literally dragged out and put on the throne on the death of their elder brother. The reason why the Ottoman system evolves in this way are twofold. Firstly, unlike the Mughals, the Ottomans are surrounded by very dangerous geopolitical enemies. Uh, the Habsburgs to the north and Iran, the, the Safavids, to the east. And it becomes simply too dangerous to allow the empire to be ripped apart by civil wars among the emperor's sons, uh, into which, of course, foreign enemies of the Ottomans will intervene and seek to undermine or even destroy the Ottoman Empire. They go over from the system of killing off all the brothers once an emperor ascends the throne because it very nearly wipes out the Ottoman dynasty and results in its extinction. All right, though, but you can see what the results of moving over to a system in which you don't kill the emperor's half-brothers, the sultan's half-brothers when he ascends the throne, but you lock them up in the cages, or indeed you lock them up in the cages even before. Uh, you, know, you then bring to the throne someone who by definition has no experience of politics or government, no networks, no contacts, uh, an inadequate education. And actually, if you look at the success of Imperial Russia in the 18th century and the failure, of course, I'm not allowed to say these things, which doesn't mean they're not true. It did fail in geopolitical terms of the Ottomans in the 18th century. Leadership is a very big issue. You know, the Ottoman Empire with its system of succession could never even remotely produce a Peter the Great, let alone, of course, a woman, a Catherine the Great. So, you know, etc. That brings me on to you know, a, a very big issue, which is consuls. Succession is linked to reproduction. Reproduction is linked to the relationship between a monarch, a sexual relationship with women, which produces heirs. Each variation on the theme of consorts has its own very important consequences. The emperors, the dynasty, the emperors may marry aristocrats from their own society. In many cases, this is the almost universal law. It has its dangers. If an emperor marries a woman from one of the leading aristocratic clans, families, he infuriates the other rival aristocratic families. He also gives an aristocratic family an enormous boost in status, which may be dangerous. You know, there are examples, Chinese history provides excellent ones, in which actually the, you know, the in-laws end up by displacing the emperor's own dynasty. Even if it doesn't go that far, there are even more examples in which the in-laws take over real power, even if the dynasty survives as a sort of, you know, legitimizing sort of element. So there are dangers, there are dangers. Right at the other extreme, the emperor deliberately or the monarchs marry down in their own societies. Um, for example, in pre-Petrine Russia, uh, the Tsar married women chosen from the middling what we would think of as county gentry uh, and that system worked quite well usually because it didn't inspire aristocratic jealousy and rivalry because his in-laws depended entirely on the tsar and yet he was able to make them 
actually very useful allies. They became a core element in his network on which he could rely completely. And it is very interesting that, you know, after Peter the Great changes all this so that Russian heirs, Russian grand dukes marry foreign princesses, in other words, the European principle, that takes out this old, you know, setup until you get to Catherine the Second. You know, because Catherine doesn't marry, or at least she did privately, but no one knew, um, her two great lovers, Alof, firstly, and then Pachonkin, actually play the role that the Tsar's in-laws used to play. They are vital as part of her network, her security system, totally dependent on her, totally loyal to her, able men. Alof and his brothers manage the guards, the guards regiments, who are the key to political security for a ruler in Russia at that time. Pachonkin rules the whole of South Russia on Catherine's behalf and gives her all sorts of good advice, emotional back, etc, 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 etc. So it's rather fascinating looking at the way in which she reverts in her own, of course, fashion to the old pre-Petrine system and uses it as an essential part of her manner of ruling, her hold on power, etc, etc, etc. The third alternative is the European one. You marry foreign princesses. Now, in one sense, that's great. It raises you well above mere aristocrats, and that's all the more important in Europe, where, you know, um, dynasty is so closely linked in principle to aristocratic dynasty as well. Um, the gap in principle is less between monarch and feudal aristocrat in Europe than it is between a Chinese emperor and his senior bureaucrat, or an Ottoman sultan and his slave, theoretically slave ministers. So, all right, it raises you above the aristocracy. It also contributes to the creation of a sense that Europe is a single civilization, in a sense, a single family, for all the arguments which happen within a family, the battles between rival dynasties, etc., etc. And it can be a way of bringing wars to an end, etc., 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 etc. But it has major problems which are unique to Europe and which are absolutely fundamental to the politics of hereditary monarchy and hereditary imperial monarchy in Europe. The first point is that you have a foreign princess at the heart of your political system with possibly, you know, great influence on the monarch, her husband, and also with great influence over the bringing up of the future monarch, her son. Uh, you know, if you think of the hatred which poured down particularly on Henrietta Maria, Charles I's wife, Marie Antoinette, and also on Alexandra, the last Russian empress, these elements come in. You have to remember that a European concert, empress, is in a rather different situation. In the first place, you're talking about Christian monogamy. You're talking about no succession to property and therefore to the monarchical office, which is perceived as a form of property from one aspect, by illegitimate children. You know, you're also talking about the dangers of inbreeding. After all, if you're constantly intermarrying in a very small group of families, you're likely to have many, many problems. And you do, the Habsburgs who take this principle in Europe to the furthest extreme, they're not quite to the level of some of the Egyptian pharaonic dynasties who married their own sisters. Look, uh, the Spanish Habsburgs die out in the male line in 1700, the Austrian Habsburgs die out in the male line in 1740. And the result are vast wars of succession, which don't just spread across the whole of Europe, but which spread out across the oceans into the European colonies overseas, etc., etc., etc. Because the point is that when the male line dies out in a dynasty, succession goes to females married to foreign princes or their sons, which of course opens up an enormous uh, can of worms. You know, the, Span the War of the Spanish Succession has a good claim to be the real First World War. And it is, in the end, a war caused by the fact that a dynasty dies out. And there is then the question whether the inheritance is going to go to the ruling house of France, which has married uh, you know, the, la the last king's aunt, or to the ruling house of, in inverted commas, Austria. 
All right, that takes me on to a more general issue, which is women and the role of women in hereditary monarchy. Now, women are almost always subordinate to men in hereditary monarchies, um, as they are in all polities. Nevertheless, they are very important. And that is inherent in the most basic principles of hereditary monarchy. Dynasty is, after all, family in power. That's the best definition. Succession is by biological reproduction. Well, over the millennia, men have thought of all sorts of crafty ways to keep women out of bureaucracies and law courts and armies and everything else, but nobody has yet been crafty enough uh, to devise a method of keeping women out of family and reproduction. So, you know, there you have it. On top of that, you know, the, the key to monarchical politics, court politics, is access to the monarch, who is the supreme fount of, priv of patronage and the supreme decision maker. Access is what courtiers dream of. Soul access for long periods is the holy grail. You know, getting, pinning the emperor down in a corner and having him to yourself, or going off hunting with him all on your own. And, uh, yeah, that's the male courtier's dream, and it is in the nature of things that the monarch's sexual partners, particularly if he's faithful to them, you know, have access to and unique access uh, to the nth degree. They're the only people who really do. Remember as well that even more generally, you know, if you're talking about the many imperial monarchies uh, which operate with harems, you know, the, the ruler will literally disappear into his harem, sometimes for days, if not weeks on end. And no ordinary male can have access to him. The only people who have access to him are either women or the eunuchs who are, in a sense, the link between you know, the female world and the outside world. So again, you know, this reinforces a point. Um, you have to remember as well that you know, the politics of hereditary monarchy are often about policy, which above all means foreign and military policy, but they are always about patronage. Women cannot occupy official positions with very rare exceptions, the governess of the imperial children being the most important. Um, you know, they can't be provincial governors, generals, judges, you name it, but they can be wonderfully powerful in an informal way at the center of networks of patronage and blood relationships. Uh, and some of these senior aristocratic women uh, are absolutely vital in that sense, in a world in which politics revolves around family, you know, dynasty, aristocratic dynasty, royal dynasty, imperial dynasty. It's a world in which women are, by the very nature of things, right at the center. If you're looking at the power of women, it is actually a wonderful little example of one of the big themes in the book. In other words, structure is against agency. You can generalize, I think, realistically about, you know, the power of consorts uh, being greater in some kinds of political system, hereditary monarchical system, dynastic tradition, than in others. I mean, obvious example. You know, a Christian empress is protected by the principle of monogamy, by the difficulty of divorce, by the complete taboo on succession by illegitimate children. It, you know, her position is, in that sense, secure. It's very difficult to get rid of her. Um, and the job, in inverted commas, goes along with a certain degree of patronage, etc. And, and of course, status. And yet, on the other hand, you know, the, the power of a woman, except in the truly exceptional circumstances where the woman is herself the sovereign, which is very rare, though uh, in interesting. In all other cases, unless she is the sovereign or more often the regent um, for a, a, you know, a child, her son, uh, a woman's power depends on a personal relationship with the monarch, the male ruler. And, you know, I'm hardly telling you anything when you say that there is nothing more difficult to generalize about than the relationship between one man and one woman. It is in it the very nature of things you need. To put it in historical terms, 
Louis XV could not get rid of his queen, Marie Leszczynska, um, whereas a Chinese emperor could get rid of an empress, demote her, uh, and of course an Ottoman sultan could have his concubines kicked out, whatever, you know, to the nth degree. Uh, so in that sense, Marie Leszczynska is secure, and she is also absolutely secure in the knowledge that her son will succeed. The one thing no French king would dare to do would be to try to displace a legitimate son by a bastard. And yet everybody knew in the 1740s, 50s, 60s, that Marie Leszczynska's influence on the king was vastly less than that of his mistress, Madame de Pompadour. It's as simple as that. If you're looking at the cases which I mentioned briefly of Henrietta Maria, Marie Antoinette and Alexandra, all of whom, or at least two of whom came to a very sticky end, um, a number of factors apart from the specifically personal um, ones go into their unpopularity. Firstly, uh, you know, as I've said, they were foreigners. Uh, secondly, you know, not merely did they have the status and the security of being a Christian consort, but they were also deeply loved by their husbands who were faithful to them. That meant that these women exercised a degree of monopoly, emotional and sexual monopoly over their husbands, and that created enormous envy and jealousy and attack. Of course, much of this is simply misogyny. All the societies, uh, you know, which I studied to varying degrees were by our standards deeply misogynist. Um, if, for example, uh, you go all the way back to St. Louis, Louis the Ninth, we're talking about the 13th century. This is, uh, you, you might say, at the very earliest origins of a Parisian public opinion. Pamphlets, which are all, of course, handwritten and sort of posted on sort of doors and things. Um, well, Louis IX's rather saintly and deeply pious mother, Blanche of Castile, is widely condemned in these pamphlets and, of course, in Parisian gossip, both for wasting French treasure and giving it to her Castilian relations and for being uh, you know, a scandalous woman. The biggest rumor is she's having some sexual affair with the papal legate, you know. I mean, of course, all total fantasy. But you know, if if this is already true in the 13th century, it is easier to understand just what Marie Antoinette faces in the 18th century. Of course, endless things have changed. There's a specific context which I could talk about for the rest of the year. Nevertheless, there is a fundal, fundamental element here. Marie Antoinette is a foreign princess, uh, and not just a foreigner, but from the Habsburg dynasty, the hereditary enemy. Uh, and not just that, she has very powerful influence over her husband, who almost uniquely for a Bourbon monarch, loves her and is faithful to her. You don't need at that point you know, to go into too much speculation as to why she should be hated, even before you get the specific 18th century French context. As I say, misogyny, but there is a certain logic in the misogyny as well, or certain sense to it. You know, a, a hereditary monarch, a hereditary emperor, is in some senses a lion tamer, that's his job, to manage the aggressive, arrogant, disputatious, ruthless types who dominate the upper ranks of most political systems, let alone most pre-modern political system, you've got to be a lion tamer. Well, of course, you know, a monarch who can't even, or is perceived as not being able even to control his wife is in deep trouble. It is a fundamental uh, attack on, on his legitimacy. All right, so I come on to my final, uh, final section, which is that the men I study were rulers of empire. You know, I could give a hundred lectures, go on forever about empire. I've written again a 600 page book on the subject. <clears throat> Basically, um, there is no single universally applicable definition of empire which is useful. 
Empires come in many shapes and sizes, even individual empires are, if you like, kaleidoscopes moving through space and time. The center's relationship with different provinces can be extremely, think of you know, the British Empire in the late 19th century, the self-governing white dominions, and you know, uh, then protectorates and then directly ruled colonies in Africa or something. Uh, they also evolve enormously over time. The Roman Empire in the first century common era is a very different animal to the third century empire. Apart from anything else, the emperors and most of the Senate are not even Italians, let alone Romans by the, the, the third and fourth century. You know, you get a hint of the difference when you remember that the word emperor, imperator, comes from the word which in Republican Roman times meant successful general. The Chinese term, which we translate as emperor, Huangdi, uh, is often literally translated as, what is it, exalted theark. I mean, it has all sorts of religious and cosmo cosmological connotations to it. Um, and, you know, without pushing things too far, I mean, the etymology of the word we describe as emperor for the two contrasting sort of ends of Eurasia tells you something about the nature of the office of Roman and Chinese emperor. They are, you know, in many ways, very different. Uh, the one is, the Chinese is above all the realm of ritual, um, what you might describe as sacred monarchy, um, very rarely and never really for long with the indigenous Chinese dynasties. Is it, for example, a military role specifically? Anyway, um, you know, if we think of empire, we tend really to associate it, or most people do in the contemporary world, with the European trans-oceanic empires, which emerged first in the 16th century and only disappeared in the second half of the 20th. And if you're looking at those empires, then, you know, I think it is fair enough to talk about a definition which stresses political conquest and domination, economic exploitation, cultural hegemony. That's about 90% true and very few other, th other things on earth are, are more than 90% true, particularly in history. Once you begin spreading beyond that particular family of empires, things get more complicated. And although I, in my book, do spend a good deal of time talking about the rulers of the European transoceanic empires, uh, I spend more time looking at the rulers of what you might describe as other families of empire. Probably the biggest of which is you know, uh, are empires where the dynasty is in its origins step nomad, warrior step nomad, you know, the Mongols, obviously, the Ottomans, uh, you know, the, the Mughals, the, to some extent, the Qing, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the, the Qing, in other words, the Manchu in China, and many, many others. Well, it's fine to talk about them in terms of political conquest and domination. It's fine to talk of them about economic exploitation. Though in these imperial systems, certainly by the time they reach their apogee, uh, the line between metropolis and, and periphery is very, very blurred. But of course, if you're talking about cultural hegemony, you're into the world of Ibn Khaldun, and the European empire's principle of cultural hegemony is turned upside down. It's very often the sedentary civilizations whom the, the warrior steppe nomads conquer who then conquer them in civilizational terms. So everything goes upside down. I mean, even if you're looking at the Chinese tradition of empire, and this is very relevant, it is fair. And I, you know, China is the only uh, imperial tradition which has three chapters in this book. Uh, you know, there is a Chinese imperial tradition, absolutely for certain, rooted in history and Confucian and Neo-Confucian ideology, all sorts of things. Nevertheless, there are very obviously two distinct variations on the theme of Chinese empire. One of them are the indigenous Han Chinese dynasties, and the other are the conquest dynasties from the, the warriors directly or indirectly from the steppe. The last two Chinese empire, empires, the Ming and the Qing, the Ming indigenous Chinese, the Qing from the northern steppe, the northern warrior, you know, cavalryman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Well, I mean, there are very fundamental differences. One of the most basic being that the Qing Empire, 14.7 million square kilometers, the Ming, 3 million, you know, that is a vast difference. And yet it is so important to remember that the present Chinese state, the People's Republic, of course is the heir of the Chinese imperial tradition, but it is specifically the heir of the Qing, not the Qing, the Manchu, not of the far smaller um, Ming or indeed earlier Song empires, which were indigenous Chinese Han, if you like, empires. So vital, so vital. Um, my own definition for what it is worth is threefold. To my mind, an empire by definition is multi-multi-ethnic, or as we might dangerously say, multinational. It is also by definition of vast extent. Managing the vast extent of empire in the pre-modern era is an enormous challenge in you know, pre-modern communications, et cetera, et cetera. It imposes certain kinds of realities on all lasting empires, the most significant of which are firstly, light touch governance. How could you have anything else? Secondly, stability requires a stable compromise between local elites and the monarchy, the central authority, um, rooted in part in a stable compromise as regards dividing up the tribute you can draw from the peasant population. Uh, I mean, I could go into this forever, but that is in some sense creating a stable and cooperative relationship between monarchy and local elites is the single most important factor in the survivability and viability of most imperial monarchies, empires. Third is power. Power is the most important thing of all. Uh, if you're not powerful enough to dominate or at least play an enormous role in the politics and international relations of a large region of the earth for a significant period, then you're not worth calling an empire in my view. So I'll talk very, very briefly about those three categories. I mean, as regards multi-ethnicity, I will simply say that you've got to be very careful not to read back into history, uh, the significance of ethno-linguistic nationalism. You know, the 19th, later 19th century particular doctrine that to every people, as defined by history, ethnicity and language, there ought to be statehood, is fatal to empire. But it is a principle that no one held to before the 19th century, or virtually no one. So we have to remember that. Scale, size is one of the themes which runs right through my book. You know, Montesquieu. And he was expressing what was taken for granted by then and seemed to be, you know, uh, borne out by virtually every episode in history. Uh, city states can't survive in the long run because they don't have the resources to protect themselves, even against medium sized monarchies, let alone against empires. But Montesquieu argued that actually it is middle sized monarchies which are the most effective scale of politics partly because it allows you to combine freedom and power, partly uh, because it allows you to have effective governance uh, in a, a relatively smallish area. And actually, from, well, for the 18th century, or for much of the 18th century, and down to the second half of the 19th century, the European national monarchies, nation states, if you want to call it, were the most powerful polities on earth. If you look at the, the contrast between Prussia and the Habsburg monarchy in the second half of the year, from the 1740s, you know, Prussia is extremely effectively managed, governed, the sprawling Habsburg domains are much less so, et cetera, et cetera. Rather interestingly, if you look at a number of books trying to you know, ask the question, why Europe, not China, for instance, in terms of the Industrial Revolution. I think quite a good argument, which is often put forward, is the idea that Britain or England was sufficiently small to be governable and is far more intensively governed, not to mention taxed, regulated, than is the case with the vast, sprawling Qing Empire. So it looks, as I say, for about 150 years, as if 
the most powerful polities on earth are the medium scale European, in inverted commas, national monarchies. And then in the second half of the 19th century, uh, things change. And that is to do with globalization. It is fundamentally to do also with technology, above all the, the railway, but also the steamship and other technologies. It is, after all, the most famous first great British geopolitician, Halford Mackinder, who says that the railway has ended what he calls the Columban age, the age of sea power, and is moving the world towards a new geopolitical era in which the most powerful polities of the world will be great continental neo empires, because you can integrate them through the railway and the telegraph, you can exploit the interiors of continents, etc, etc, etc. And then the final point, uh, which pushes you back towards empire is the rise of the United States, it was self evident to any intelligent statesman in Europe by the 1890s, and to intelligent observers of international relations, uh, that the United States in the 20th century was going to be a superpower on a scale that no normal European polity could be. Unless you could match America's continental scale and resources, uh, you had no chance of competing at great power level with the United States in the future. And that is the geopolitical basis for the era of high imperialism. It is the justification for taking over large swathes of the world because this is the only way that a European polity could acquire continental scale resources, et cetera, et cetera. And we're still there. You know, is not the European Union an attempt to square the circle? You know, you want on the one hand, the power of the nation, the nation and nationalism consolidate communities ripped apart by the industrial revolution and mass migration. They legitimize elites and governments. They give individuals a sort of substitute for religion, a, a place in the great scheme of things, a touch of the heroic, a sense of community, a sense of et etc. Et et You've got to combine that with the external power that empire provides. And then you get all these, you know, variations on the theme and the European Union is an attempt to square the circle and has a hell of a lot of trouble legitimizing and therefore creating an effective continental scale government in the continent Europe, which invented modern nationalism and is still in hot to it. You know, on the other hand, India, China, the United States, all in their different ways are sort of empire nations of one sort or another. And one of the problems here is that empires were always devils to govern because of their scale and their variety. But actually, in most empires, for most of the time, the rulers, the top rulers only really needed to worry about keeping the top 2% of society on board. Because actually, that top 2% usually, through their own systems of coercion and patronage, ran on a day to day basis, most of everyday life for the 98% or to the extent that their lives were run at all. Of course, in the modern world, in the world of mass literacy, mass politics, God help us democracy, in the world in which government is simply expected to play a far bigger role than it ever did in the past in most societies, you do have the problem and it is a very frightening one, that the only countries in the world which are on a scale to have a real influence on the future of mankind, not least in facing challenges like climate change, are actually almost ungovernable by definition. Uh, and that is frightening. All right, so on to my absolutely final comments. Um, no, well, no, I've got to say something about power. Well, just briefly, of course, power means much more than just military, economic power, it means cultural, ideological, etc, etc, etc. Um, I, for instance, have two chapters in my book, one on nomadic and specifically Mongol Empire, the other on the Caliphate, particularly, you know, the early Caliphate, the Umayyad, the Abbasids, and the first, the first four Caliphs as well. Well, you know, both of those, in a sense, are examples of the power of warrior nomadism. And actually, the Mongols are much more powerful in that sense uh, than the, the, the Arab armies which emerge from Arabia and create the caliphate, because the, the Mongols are operating in the absolute heartland of nomadism, 
are able to gather much larger armies. They also have a much more sophisticated military technology, horse archers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the Arabian Peninsula simply doesn't produce as many, not nearly as many nomadic warriors. They also fight on foot. It's not as if they've got some inherently much superior uh, tactics and you know, military technology. But unlike the, Mo the Mongols, they have enormous ideological power. I mean, the, the, the caliphate represents the, the alliance of two of the most fundamental sources of power uh, in that millennium. On the one hand, nomad military power. On the other hand, the ideological and cultural power, and therefore political too, as a form of unity and motivation of Islam. Uh, and that brings home a basic point about the emperors. Most of the emperors I spend time on uh, are not just you know, military political rulers. The most interesting and important empires are the ones which are linked to some great universal religion or high civilization, because they determine not just who rules, but in the name of what values large swathes of the world are ruled. And that applies to you know, the early caliphs. It applies in principle to you know, the Habsburgs of the Counter-Reformation. It applies to Queen Victoria, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the society she represented. So on to my final comments. The first and obvious one is that being an emperor was one hell of a job, usually. You, know, you were expected to various degrees and in various combinations to be the chief political officer, often the, the commander-in-chief, the warrior ruler, the sacred ruler, the impresario of the social life of the elite, uh, as expressed in the court, the manager in the same sort of way of the dynasty and the polity's propaganda machine. Quite a burden, and you're expected to hold it for the whole of your adult life. But failure or relative failure is unsurprising. The other point to mention is simply that emperors mattered enormously. I mean, above all, and most obviously, they mattered on issues of foreign and military policy and at times of crisis. Policy above all in most of these imperial dynasties is foreign and military policy. That is the core of the emperor's metier, his job, and that remains true down to 1940, at least in the perception of the monarchs themselves. Uh, and actually, I, I, I've been talking for too long, so I'll stop in a second. But there are examples of key decisions made uh, which resonate right down to the present day. For example, just one, 17, 1670s, third Qing, Manchu Emperor Kanxi. He, at the age of 19, takes the decision to try to conquer South China, and it very nearly goes wrong. Uh, had it gone wrong and it hung by a thread, the Qing might have collapsed completely. Certainly, they would only have ruled the same empire that their ancestors, the so-called Yurchens, ruled in the, the 12th and 13th centuries. Had that been the case, they would not have had the resources to conquer what we now call Xinjiang, and probably not Taiwan either. So we would be in a completely different world in which the PRC would, in some sense, be the heir of the Ming, not the Qing. I mean, these are all counterfactuals. I never knows, but you know, these things matter. Crisis, just quote, the only thing I will quote from, I think, probably the most exciting historian of imperial China, that little me, whose knowledge is like this, knows a character called Yuri Pines. He wrote, at times of crisis, when swift and resolute decision-making was required, many emperors proved completely inadequate fluctuating between competing court factions, acting erratically and hastening their dynasty's demise. Now that is a wonderful description of Louis XVI's performance in 1789. I think if, and this is of course a silly counterfactual, Louis, the, Louis XVI had been his brother-in-law, the, the Emperor Leopold II of Austria, with his qualities, there wouldn't have been a revolution. Of course, that's a hunch, it can never be more, but it's an interesting one, even an issue as absolutely fundamental to modern history as the French Revolution. I think that actually a monarch of Louis, Leopold II's caliber, rather than the very decent and by no means stupid, but completely inadequate as a political ruler, Louis XVI, a revolution could probably have been avoided. 
<clears throat> Longer term, well, I've already talked. I mean, I've given you the example of the Russian, uh, Russian and Ottoman emperors in the 18th century. I will say no more, though I could talk forever. Finally, just think of the impact of Constantine's uh, adoption of what we later came to call Roman Catholicism. Without Emperor Ashoka, Buddhism might well have disappeared entirely and would almost certainly have been confined a bit like Jainism uh, to a relatively small minority sect in India. Think of if Queen Mary of England, Mary I, had lived as long as her father, Henry VIII, or her sister, Elizabeth, probably England would have reverted to Catholicism. And finally, you know, what is the most important geopolitical element in the contemporary Middle East? Well, I think you could certainly argue that it's the fact that Iran is Shia and most of the rest of the region is Sunni. Well, that is actually something traceable directly back to Shah Ismail, the Safavid ruler of Iran in the early 16th century. And at that point, thank God, I will end. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I'm sorry I talked for so long. It's rather a big subject. No, no, no. Uh, we, I mean, this is so fascinating. We could uh, have all night or all day. <laughs> Dominic, this is fantastic. Uh, can I ask you the first question, maybe? Everybody, yeah. Which is a bit of a crazy question. Is, I yeah. mean, you made clear at the beginning that most of the history to descri you described of emperors, not, yeah. not, 90, not 100 percent, but you know, largely is men. And yeah. what does this, you know, in principle, you have about half the population is men and half is women, more or less, yeah. everywhere. What does this power, why does the power kind of almost universally switch to men? And still today, you know, yeah. in Scandinavia, there are societies where you know, now it's uh, the power is uh, divided half half. No? But yeah. uh, I mean, in many other countries, it's 100 percent or 99 sure. percent. Uh, men. Why is this? What, what are, is it just the biology or the you know, body power? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, Gerhard, firstly, you're asking me a question which I'm incompetent to answer. Each of us could answer that question as well as I am. I mean, if you're talking about the ultimate roots of this. Um, I, I can't really dig back into this. My empires were founded in societies which already had an old history. And in almost all those societies, by the time these empires were created, men dominated women to varying degrees. But, you know, if you're look at, looking at ancient political thought, all of ancient political thought, uh, to varying degrees, to the extent it has come down to us, you know, obviously with Confucius, uh, but not differently in, you know, in Christian theology and Christian social thinking, certainly not, of course, in Islam comes later, um, certainly not um, in, um, you know, the, in ancient Persia, out of which the Achaemenids come, etc., etc., etc. In each case, there is a presumption uh, that men rule that men dominate. The role of women differs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. I mean, one interesting point is that if one's looking at the nomadic step tradition, women play a bigger public and overt role than they do in most sedentary societies and certainly in Confucian China, which helps to explain, for instance, why in the Tang dynasty, you, you do for a time have women actually not just playing a major overt public role, but actually you have the only example of a Chinese sovereign empress who sets up her own dynasty um, and of very, very powerful uh, you know, females who aren't actually officially regents. So, I mean, there are variations, but nevertheless, the basic principle is there. And then on top of that, you would have to reckon that empires are in almost all cases created initially by conquest. Well, you know, I'm sure there are societies, ancient societies in women, in which women play a major role in armies, in, in actual warfare. But that is exceptional. So once you're talking, I mean, if you're talking about hereditary monarchy per se, you can find in Africa, and I suspect in one or two other 
in inverted commas, primitive societies. Examples of succession by the matrilineal line. Uh, although even there, usually the succession by the matrilineal line, it is a man who, you know, who, 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 who succeeds to the throne. But nevertheless, the matrilineal line is the line of succession and women play very important roles. But you don't get that in any imperial monarchies. And I suspect that is to do firstly with the fact that they are, um, in almost all cases, military monarchies initially created by conquest. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, now, uh, the first question I have here is from, uh, where is he going? Uh, we told, yeah, yes, we, we told. Uh, we told asks about Napoleon. <laughs> we told. Oh, yeah. Uh, hello? Do you want me to ask the question? Yes, of course. Yes, okay. So, um, why, why did Napoleon want to become emperor? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, I don't cover Napoleon at any length because I do try and focus on hereditary emperors. Um, and, and Napoleon is, as you might say, a self-made man. In other words, the kind of upbringing and training qualities uh, that he possessed were not typical of you know, a man who had been born on the steps of the throne. Um, I think, but on the other hand, you know, I wrote my book, Russia Against Napoleon, so of course I do know something about it. Uh, there are a number of issues, I think. One is that, you know, this is ambition. Uh, as Aristotle himself said, you know, any man who is a monarch will want to keep his family in power. That was seen as part of almost human nature. You know, a, a father wants son to succeed him. It's almost, you know, an individual human being's answer to the problems of death and you know eternity there is also the fact that napoleon in, in is, is a fascinating character but in many of his basic attitudes particularly when it comes to family relationships with women he's deeply conservative you know um he, he is very much a man who for whom family his relationship with his mother his brother, you know this really matters so that but there's also an absolutely fundamental political uh, set of calculations. In the first place, I mean, Napoleon is attempting to put the revolution to bed. Uh, you know, he's attempting to take revolutionary ideology, republican ideology out of politics and to restore what he would conceive of as order in France through a compromise between pre-revolutionary old regime and revolutionary principles. I mean, he's, a, you know, he's a stability is what he's after. And actually, you know, the, the, the argument for hereditary monarchy since time immemorial has been stability. And actually, you know, if you're attempting to give French elites a sense that you're here to stay, that they should invest their ambitions in your regime rather than trying to work out who's going to be in power in five years time. The stability provided by hereditary monarchy is absolutely crucial. Again, you can think of it the other, uh, another way as well. If you're talking about creating empires, conquest is only the first stage. Creating political institutions is the second stage and creating widespread sense of legitimacy for the empire is the third. Well, the most important of all political institutions is hereditary monarchy, because it guarantees the continuity of the polity and therefore encourages long term commitment to the polity. You know, um, I mean, look, sorry, I'm now jumping off like a flea, but one of the problems with these recent American interventions in uh, you know, Afghanistan, in Iraq, etc., is that if you're going to, as every empire needs to do, co-opt um, local elites into your system, you've got to give them a sense that you're here to stay, you know, apart from anything else, if you don't, uh, and, and no one could ever be persuaded that the Americans are going to stay anywhere, you have the very strong feeling that, you know, the reward for your collaboration may in the very short run be cheerful, you know, goodies, uh, but 15 years down the line, either you or your children will have their throats slit. Um, you know, 
hereditary monarchy is a guarantee of stability. I mean, one of the great things about hereditary monarchy, I didn't have time to say this, is that a dynasty which has lasted for long enough becomes part of the legends, the law, the memory of its community. Uh, and that becomes very important indeed, because it is it becomes absolutely essential to the identity of a community. How many of the folk stories, you know, that one knows about are of the good king, the this, that, something else? You know, good King Wenceslas uh, with the Czech. So it's important. Um, so I think probably I would stress those things without in any sense pretending to be an expert on, on the pony. Okay, uh, next question, thank you. Alan, I think, has the subsequent question. Alan? Yes, <laughs> Professor Liebman, amazing by Hello. coincidence. Uh, I, I was going to ask this question, how does Tilsit fit oh, into yes. your narrative and analysis? It's a unique meeting, as far as I know, of two emperors. Of course, Napoleon and... Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, frankly, it doesn't fit into this uh, book. It's not even mentioned, no. because as I say, I don't... Uh, you know, but it was hugely relevant. I, I wrote a book called Russia Against Napoleon. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's that was, what I yeah, that was that. absolutely relevant. Well, I mean, one way of thinking of Tilsit is that um, it's a rather interesting early example of summitry. Right. You know, think how many so-called summits we have nowadays which bring together the top political leaders. Um, and they have their charms and their dangers. Uh, their charms are, at least in theory, that if you get the supreme leaders talking to each other, um, if they come to agreements, they can enforce them. Uh, and that is even more true if you're talking not about leaders of modern democracies, uh, where you know to get anything done requires endless consultation, and this and that, parliaments, you name it, laws. Um, but you're dealing with autocrats who are sovereign. In principle, at that point, they make decisions and they stick, particularly as regards foreign, foreign policy. Uh, on the other hand, of course, there are tremendous dangers, not least because in any political system, there are dangers in giving the sovereign, or can be dangers, in giving the sovereign too overt a role. Uh, because, of course, that does expose him to delegitimization if a policy for which he is clearly responsible fails dramatically. So there's a tendency in many of the imperial systems, some much more than others, to sort of, you know, preserve the emperor as the final uh, source of authority. But when things go wrong, blame the grand vizier or his equivalent. You know, that's one of the uses of having a grand vizier. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, to, to go specifically into Tilsit, as I say, is to take me back into... Uh, that book I wrote by now some years ago. Um, it, it is essentially, from Alexander's point of view, um, a very useful meeting because he ends a war which was going very badly and which could only be sustained by Russia um, at enormous cost and with very significant domestic political dangers attached. It ends a war without, in the normal way of ending defeated wars, mm. um, no indemnity, no annexation. Right. Uh, it buys him time. Uh, and maybe, or maybe not, we can't, be, we can't be entirely sure. He thinks, let's give it a go and see whether this works. You know, the, the, the Franco-Russian uh, entente. Um, it doesn't, as he quickly comes to recognise. But even so, it's bought him five pr priceless years to prepare. So I think that's how he, you know, he he, he would um, have calculated. I mean, he he is he he does appear in my book, and he's a fascinating character for all sorts of ways. Partly because he just is; he's a very interesting human being, but partly because he embodies some of the key themes and contradictions which run through the whole business. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. No, I mean he he certainly does. Um, not least in personal terms, because, you know, here is a man brought up on the best principles of the radical enlightenment by Lahat, his tutor, who is the monarch of 
you know, the autocrat of Russia. I mean, the, the basis of the political system is a distinctly nasty version of serfdom. Um, so that does go some way to explaining some of the frustration and sense of, you know, failure that, that Alexander has. Um, there are other elements, you know, lots and lots of other elements as well. I mean, it's fascinating, for instance, you know, Alexander is a product of the late Enlightenment, as well, of course, of his grandmother's court, uh, but particularly the sort of, you know, ideology of so-called friendship. Yeah. So he and his wife were married off when he was 15 and she was 40, poor sweet duck, you know, and they in time go their own way. And because he goes his own way, he allows his wife to have, you know, the odd lover, one of whom you know, whom she adores, and generally they were both in love. Um, she produces two children from. Fortunately, as Alexander himself says, he recognises these children as his own. Um, fortunately, daughters, because otherwise the whole issue of the succession would come <laughs> up. Uh, well, you know, playing around with the succession is a very, very dangerous thing to do in imperial monarchy. And his younger brother and heir, the Grand Duke Constantine, who is a thoroughly unpleasant time, you know, doesn't like this one bit, of course. So he sends his cronies out to marry, to murder his sister-in-law's lover. You know, you, you get th this sort of mixture of, you know, the world of the advanced world of European sensibility, you know, uh, the culture of the, the late Enlightenment with the hard-headed succession politics of imperial monarchy. So it's complicated. It's complicated, but he is a fascinating character. I mean, he's, I, actually, I rather like Alexander, um, but you, you find in him again, something which is very, he's exhausted by, you know, the last 10 years of his reign. Uh, he's a sensitive man. He, they, you know, he, he doesn't, he dislikes the sort of tough types you often have to cope with him. Uh, politics. He comes as so many monarchs do to basically despise them and dislike their ambition and their egoism and their bullying. He's stuck with a job he can't get, get away from it. At least it's very difficult to do it. He sort of retreats into his own world and lets Eric Chief run most of the internal, yeah. you know, setup, um, which isn't quite as disastrous as Tang Xuanzong, but does make him very, you know, unpopular. Um, and he also, in, you know, in personal terms, this is a man who has grand ideas and is an idealist. He's lost his, you know, sort of, to misuse a term, liberal um, enlightenment reformers in many of the aspects by then. As with many people, he's become older and tired and less <laughs> convinced that you can change human beings, let alone change them through <laughs> politics and government. But on the other hand, that has been succeeded by a sort of Christian and almost evangelical idealism. So in the last year or two of his reign, he's beginning to dream and even plot. He's entering into negotiations with the Vatican for the reconciliation of Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy, you know, which is an even more impossible dream than trying to introduce a constitution to the Russia of his day. So it's fascinating. <laughs> but it tells you something about the frustrations, you know. It's not altogether, I mean, his, the monarch he was brought up to admire more than anyone was Marcus Aurelius, um, because this was the hero of yeah. um, uh, Lahat, you know, his, his governor. Yeah. And of course, it is to the point that Marcus Aurelius is always called, you know, the, the emperor who would have restored the republic if Rome was able to sustain a republic. Yeah. Well, Alexander certainly felt that Russia was unworthy of him in many ways, you know, in the Russia that he had inherited trying to realize his ideals was impossible, you know, and, and that creates deep frustration and alienation. There's also the more basic point of this you come across in a number of emperors, including Chinese ones, and is actually very much to the point in the present day as well, including with Tony Blair, um, but with other, you know, leaders nowadays. Uh, foreign policy and military policy is often so much more fun. You know, you give orders and in principle they're obeyed, from time immemorial, foreign policy and military policy are regarded as the, you know, the absolute legitimate sphere 
for the emperor or the king to, to operate in. Uh, and, and once you've got rid of feudalism, you know, armies and diplomats do more or less respond to your orders. Domestic politics <laughs> are far more messy, you know, <laughs> domestic interests to trip over. Um, mm. And I mean, one issue, having sorted out the future of Europe, as you saw it, you know, between 1807 and 1815, mm. coming back to try and manage the nitty gritty of domestic Russian administration and the frustrations and annoyances of your often ghastly advising. And I think, you know, I doubt whether Tony Blair was much different by the time he'd ceased to be prime minister. Um, <laughs> you know, and there is also, you know, the red carpets, the, the, the jamboree, yeah. the whole lot, the guards of honor, a bit different going off and trying to talk to obstreperous sort of councillors in Wigan, let alone <laughs> try and persuade various vested interests to, you know, cough up a little bit of their ill-gotten goods, all this kind of stuff. You know. yeah. well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next question is by Atin. Atin, do you want to ask your question? Atin? Hi there. Sorry for being late this morning. Um, Not at all. My question was regarding the potential for a resurgence in empire in the modern day, given the vast challenges we face um, from climate change and global instability in general. Um, sure. What do you see as the potential um, for a resurgence in that kind of a polity? Look, if you mean a resurgence of hereditary imperial monarchy, certainly is anything more than a purely symbolic legitimizing element in, you know, a, a, a polity where formal uh, real power exists elsewhere. No, you know, no, I can in no sense conceive of the United States or China or, or you know, in Russia, it is just on the outer edges of possibility that the Romanovs might come back. I mean, Yeltsin really did seriously think about this, but it's very unlikely by now. And even if they did, they would not be true rulers. They would be, you know, etc. If on the contrary, you're talking about empire, meaning a polity which is both multinational, enormous scale, and very powerful. Well, we have got them. I mean, that is, I mean, in a sense, the, you know, what I was talking about when I talked about the geopolitics of the era of high imperialism. You know, why do we, why do we worry about China and the United States, possibly Russia, um, down the line, probably India, the European Union, if it could actually you know, consolidate more effectively. If they're already now in some issues, commerce, for instance, trade. Well, because they are polities of imperial scale, you know. Um, so in, in that sense, yes, we have. I mean, the basic point is perfectly simple. Um, the logic of geopolitics is what the logic of geopolitics was set out by, you know, mostly European thinkers in the late 19th, early 20th century. Europe was the wrong place to apply it for all sorts of historical reasons, as two world wars rather prove. But the basic argument that to count in the world of the future, you need to be a polity of continental scale and resources is dead true. Um, and as I, I tried to say, one of the problems is that the countries, the, the handful of countries who fit that definition and who, which will determine the future of the globe mostly, uh, are by definition enormously difficult to govern because they have all the traditional problems of empire, but they also um, have the problems of, you know, empire in the modern context. In other words, mass literacy, urbanization, democracy, for God's sake, and the fact that government is just expected uh, to do far more. I mean, again, Obama's memoir is fascinating, you know, his comment that actually it's virtually impossible to do anything, get anything done as the president of a vast, you know, very various, um, diverse uh, polity, um, especially in a democracy. And yet we have the awful conundrum that actually climate change means that governments have got to act. You know, they really have got to act. Um, and they've got to uh, impose what are going to be, you know, some very difficult uh, sacrifices and compromises on their own societies. And at the same time, then, you know, if we're talking about the first one, uh, persuade those societies that to have any chance of coping with the climate crisis, 
you've got to show a very great deal of enlightened self-interest. <coughs> and I stress enlightened, plus a bit of generosity, actually, um, in the way you, 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 know, you, you relate to what I still call the third world. It's going to be very difficult. I, I would have thought that, frankly, democracy is a dead duck uh, outside the first world, given the difficulties that already exist, given the enormous difficulties uh, that climate change is going to impose, particularly on the third world. You'd have to be very optimistic, I think, to imagine that anything like Western style liberal democracy is going to survive in anything but a rather small group of states, if that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it might survive in the first world if we react intelligently, um, though I suspect if it's more likely to be a populist plebiscitarian democracy than a liberal one. Uh, and given the enormous strains, you know, even in the first world, um, electorates are going to take some persuading to show even enlightened self-interest, let alone generosity, outside their borders. I mean, you know, if you if you look at the combination of American Chinese competition, you know, if we didn't succeed in integrating Germany before 1914 into the international system dominated by basically the Anglophone world, and you know, this is semi-liberal very capitalist, mostly Protestant Germany. Um, China is a far bigger uh, challenge. You know, one's dealing with a country from an entirely different tradition. Um, and that's going to be very difficult, even before you get to the fact that given how very hard it is to govern either China or the United States, the governments in both societies are increasingly using an external enemy. Uh, for reasons of domestic consolidation and legitimacy. Um, so there are enormous dangers there. And then you throw into that equation the tremendous pressure that the climate crisis is going to put, exert on populations and governments, even if we manage things more intelligently than we are at the moment. So, I mean, you're really dealing with enormously dangerous you know, crises, I think, coming up. I'm a gloomy aging male. I mean, I'm probably, you know, as Gerhard told these lovely stories about how there's a way in which sort of distinguished elderly male fellows at Trinity are always predicting the end of the world. Sometimes I suspect that that is sort of, you know, some consolation to one's own extinction. You know, it's the sort of, it's, it's I mean, in a entirely nice sense, but, you know, history ends with me. How can I envisage? Of course, I you know, of course one can, but at the same time, there's a sort of tendency and also just simply everything is changing at such speed that life is very bewildering for oldies like me. Um, you know, I make the sign of the cross every time I turn on my computer in case, you know, I evaporate or something, you know, it's all, you know. Um, my natural inclination is to summon a priest and get the whole thing exercised. I have the basic attitude of modern technology of a peasant who first saw an aeroplane and mistook it for a large bird which made rumbling noises, you know, etc. Um, so I may be, you know, there's a high chance I'm getting over depressed and this and that, but it does seem to me to be a very formidable challenge, which is coming up. And of course, if we get into the realm of geoengineering, then that will even more than ever stress the role of great powers, you know, um, you know, in the end, I suspect, you know, we may not be too far away from you know, the, the old thing, the Peloponnesian War, the Thucydides, or right, I get them mixed up. No, Thucydides, the, the strong do what they want and the weak do what they must. You know, it's not going to be a pleasant world. I mean, you, I mean if you look at American politics now, um, you know, I, I must say under Trump, I reckon that the United States was more of a threat to the future of the world than China, for the simple reason that, you know, my emperors uh, did not, you know, they never faced a crisis on a scale of the climate crisis. You know, human beings didn't have that power. I must say, did, you know, China stood out a mile by the fact that they were already, you know, going in for vast scale engineering products, you know, river management, water management, this kind of stuff, at a time when the Europeans were still basically wandering around in the swamp. Uh, but, you know, none of my emperors, okay, they did make the final decisions on foreign policy and war. None of them had the power to end the existence of the human race in the course of a sort of long weekend international mm -hmm. crisis, which drew them away from the soothing influences of their harem or their golf course. 
I mean, watching Trump in power and watching, you know, the American elite's management of the sovereign, i.e. the people, managing the sovereign was always very difficult. Managing emperors could be extremely difficult. You know, the sovereign is now the people. Well, I'm not necessarily sure that that makes me feel more happy. You know, I mean, the average level of, of, of wisdom, of understanding of the outside world, let alone the fact that, of course, if you've got, if everything in a society, including its foreign policy, becomes an issue of party politics and extreme polarization, you can achieve nothing. Mm. So it's, it's very frightening. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is a difficult one for Martin. He wants, uh, Martin, why don't you ask? He wants a ranking of emperors, like a. Uh, uh -huh. I was just wondering. We we talk, you you sort of talked a lot in general terms. Yeah. And um, uh, just for the fun of it, I just wondered if you had a kind of list of favorites. Yes. And if so, on what yeah. grounds you judge? Yeah. Yeah. It might be yeah. quite interesting to hear about that. But well, I mean, of course, I've never, you know, I'm not a political ever. scientist. I've never tried to draw up a kind of map. But of course, inevitably, in my own mind, I've got a list. And perhaps also inevitably, because it's not, it's just in my own little sweet mind, thinking at two in the morning, I can sometimes, you know, blur the distinction between rulers who I actually rather like, you know, um, for various reasons and effectiveness which are, of course, are, are very often not at all the same thing. I mean, probably of all of them, to, and one knows them to very different degrees, you know. Mm. Um, you know, with Marcus Aurelius, for instance, because of his meditations, mm. one is almost in the position of being the man's father confessor. Mm. Um, in the case of some other em emperors, you know, you do have deeply private writings which allow you to get a pretty good sense of elements of the personality. In other cases, particularly as you get into the more modern era, but also, you know, with the Roman emperors in particular, though, as always, you have to be very careful about the sources and their biases. You do get a very large first, you know, um, primary source set of uh, descriptions and evaluations of these monarchs. So there are all these kind of problems, but I mean, I mean if you want, I'd probably put Akbar first. Mm. You know, absolutely fascinating character, made all the more remarkable by the fact that he was dyslexic. Um, mm. Actually a genuinely attractive character, intellectually curious, fine artistic aesthetic sense, humane. Um, a man who over and above the politics of religion, clearly was driven by a rather agonized personal search for meaning and this and that. Um, but also great fun, you know, astonishing character. Um, I mean, Peter the Great was as, Peter of Russia, as astonishing, in some ways, of course, much less attractive. Now, whether that's Peter or whether it's the context in which he's placed, also, in some ways, I mean, in some ways, in cultural terms, absolutely fascinating, but not a man of deep personal culture for the very obvious reason that, um, you know, pre petrine Russia didn't have a secular high culture, you know, um, anything to do with ultimate meanings and also really to do with beauty or not any, that most things were, were in, you know, religious, it was a religious, it was to do with the music, the painting of the culture of the Orthodox Church, which Peter to some extent rejects anyway. So you haven't got the same sort of cultural sophistication as you would have with an Akbar. You know, Akbar is great because he brings together and patronizes in a very personal way the, the you know, the, the intermarriage or the interlinking of a sort of Persian high culture, um, an Islamic high culture, and they're not already. And then, of course, with the Sanskrit culture, which comes out of, you know, indigenous Indian roots and creates or helps to create something which is really unique. You know, this, after all, is an era in which court patronage matters enormously. You know, so, so that's fascinating. You get something of the same with Kangxi and Yongzheng in China, both of whom I like enormously. Hmm. Um, you know, if you go right back to the beginning, I mean, among the earliest emperors, 
you know, it's, it's impossible not to respect Marcus Aurelius. Mm. Um, I can't say he greatly attracts me. Partly, I mean, poor man, you can understand, he, you know, fairly enough in his you know, meditations, he wonders whether he'll ever, you know, ever feel real love. And this is a man already is on the way out in his 50s, I think. Um, well, of course, you know, he's incapable of feeling genuine love in the sense of any kind of equal relationship with a woman. It's interesting in his meditations, he's got whole paragraphs about sort of third tutors and 11th this and that. The only two women who get a mention are his wife and his mother, and it's pretty brief in both cases. Meanwhile, he despises homosexuals, which is why he doesn't mention, you know, his initial great mentor who chose him, after all, as ultimate heir, which was Hadrian, who was about the most famous homosexual emperor in history. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I know this is probably a damn stupid comment, but also having lived through the awful misogyny and coldness of the English public school system and the extent to which, you know, Matthew Arnold, he, uh, Marcus Aurelius was his hero. Um, I, I think I have a sort of basic bias against anything like that. I prefer, I mean, if you may, I far prefer Tang Taizong, you know, who's, uh, you can get a real insight to not to quite the same extent as Marcus Aurelius, but a bit through his poetry, of course, all in translation, you know, so, um, but also from those, above all, those two great sort of pamphlet length memoranda, you know, he wrote, um, the second of which in particular is a secret memorandum aimed at his heir, you know, um, but he was also more fun, actually, than poor old Marcus Aurelius, or at least, he comes across as that, you know. Um, I, I don't like Alexander of Macedon. I have a, I mean, there, he's, he is, I mean, obviously a fascinating human being. He's also very interesting for me because he does combine what you might describe as the charisma of hereditary monarchy, which what Weber would have called traditional authority with charisma, the personal charisma you know, the old Greek tradition of the, the, the hero um, who was godlike almost, you know, he was so superior that he was, so, he was godlike, I mean, in the, in the Greek meaning of the word godlike. And that is actually an interesting theme because contrasting hereditary, monarchical and charismatic, you know, authority is actually a very useful way of bringing together disparate elements. Think about, um, Alexander of Macedon, though, he has charisma in the sense of the Greek heroic tradition, you know, um, or indeed the later romantic tradition in Europe. I mean, you know what, Alexander conquers the world and dies young. That's the basis for the romantic hero, you know. Mm. Uh, but he doesn't have what Weber talks about as sort of prophetic charisma, you know. For that, you've got to wait for really, certainly in modern history, for, for Lenin, Mussolini and Hitler. I mean, uh, Napoleon has all the charisma of an Alexander, but not a prophetic one. On the contrary, as, as, as sort of to an earlier question, I mean, he's trying really to play down the, the charismatic, the, the prophetic element, which is the revolutionary ideology. Mm -hmm. Lots of, I, li I like Catherine. I like Catherine II. I like Maria Theresa. Absolutely fascinating. You, you know. I wanted to ask you about her. Yeah, well, I mean, Gerhard, I say this actually virtually on page one of the book. It's on Austria now, you know, in May. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, and she deserves it. Look at it. She comes to the throne in 1740 with minimal real preparation, certainly for government. Her father, though he may, you know, moved heaven and earth to ensure that she inherited and therefore go to go, never taught her anything about government. He put her husband on the governing council, not her. Second, she becomes empress. Maria Theresa is pretty determined to show who's in charge and does. Um, and actually, you know, she inherits an empire in de de deepest crisis, uh, gets it through uh, that war. She leaves the empire much more powerful, richer, but also more decent than she inherited. A number of very important humanitarian reforms, above all, educational reforms, where she was of really very great personal importance. Yes. Um, she also has, what, 16, 17 children? Uh, 16, you know, I think. 16. 16 children, I think it is, yeah. But, uh, you know, if, if uh, you probably don't 
remember this, but when I was writing this book and I was, you know, most of it, I was down in our country house, you know, near Rat, I think. Um, and one of my connections to the outside world, for better or worse, was the BBC, which is great. But before a lot of their news, they would have these endlessly repeated and rather infuriating snippets from great people, including Jessica Ardern, you know, the, no, Jacinda Ardern, the, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, absolutely admirable. Um, but she infuriated me by going on by saying, not seriously infuriated, that she was only the second woman to have ever had a child while in top public office. Of course, she was talked about democratic, you know, whatever. But of course, you know, Maria Theresa inherited the throne age, what, 23, 20, 22, minimal experience, three enemy armies on her soil, revolt, you know, even the, well, the Bohemian estate certainly pledged allegiance to, you know, Charles Albert of Bavaria. Um, and you go on and on and on. Uh, and then she turns it round. She rules for 40 years. As I say, she leaves the empire much stronger and much better than she inherited it. Uh, and she produces all those children. Well, there are all these talk about role models. You, know, you talk about role models. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a historian, so I don't know. I haven't checked the sources, but the stories you hear in Austria is that she built a stairway up to the bedroom so she could ride the horse straight to the... No. I don't think this is true, but she certainly was a, a woman of formidable but She had produced will. 16 children with her husband. But she was also a human being. Yes. I mean, with, with all the failings, but also the wonderful human courage and endurance. And, I mean, one know, of the intelligence. big um, uh, impact she has on Austria, even today, is yeah. that he hired uh, Gerard from Sweden, from Holland. You know, she kind of yeah. hated him from way, you know, in those days, that was like three weeks. No, no, all in Austria, no? okay. How he I tell you, someone who I also admire enormously is her son, Leopold II. Uh, you mentioned he ruled many for two years, but he was an exceptionally intelligent. I mean, he, he must have been the product of, uh, to some extent, of uh, his mother, no? Oh, yes. But he was also, he had a sort of full scale enlightenment education, which of course she didn't. Although, I mean, she was well educated by the standards of Catholic elite society of her day. She was not much worse educated than a boy from that world, except that she'd been taught no law, of course, or administration or anything like this, you know, despite the fact she's going to become empress. I mean, but, but fascinating. So there are a whole number of them, a um, whole number of them, uh, which made it all great fun. It does also come back to something I was saying earlier, you know, biography does allow a sort of empathy, a mm. sort of... Um, almost sensuality, a sense of um, which structural analysis doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, and that I think it certainly added something to the fun of, uh, you, you know, the book. It, it certainly also helps with imagination. You can imagine yourself. Yeah, the human side. No? Yeah, we're humans, they're humans. You can imagine, that's why historical novels are such fun, um, if they're good. Um, structural analysis does not do that. <laughs> Does your book lie closer to that world, the sort of historical novel, as it were, but obviously, no, no, it or, doesn't. or are you yeah. trying to look at a structural problem? Both. And, both. And I'm trying to interweave both. them. I see. Yeah. But it's not, I mean, it's certainly not a historical novel, you know. Mm. Um, this is history, and when the sources don't allow one to know something, mm. I say it. Um, Can I ask you another question to the yeah. puzzle side, which we just discussed? Yeah, we uh, on in November we have Sir Simon Baron Cohen talking on autism. You know. Yeah, I want to. I'm, uh, both my wife and I want to come into that conversation. It's absolutely fascinating. Please join. So my question would be, we, we can repeat that question when we have the discussion with with uh, Simon Baron Cohen. Yeah. My question here would be, well, maybe if you don't, if you prefer, we can postpone it to that discussion. Yeah. But my question here would be, are any of your uh, emperors and empresses who you uh, have in your mind now, yeah. where you know that they have been autistic or where you think they could have been? Because, uh, um, you know? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, of course, autism is not 
prescribed, I mean, you know, defined in those days. Um, and I haven't got them in front, I'm not a doctor and I haven't got them in front of me. So one has to be very, you know, slow, but certainly some of them were crazy. Um, and in the sort of, you know, crude everyday idea about autism. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, there is a, and this is to do with leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, and Maria Theresa and her son Joseph II would be perfect examples. Some of them were very good at human relationships. Mm -hmm. They could inspire loyalty, personal loyalty, mm -hmm. uh, over and above you know, what was owed to their office. Some were totally incapable of relating to human beings, really, or managing them sensibly. Uh, and Maria Theresa and Joseph II, in many ways, are opposite poles on that spectrum. I, I don't think there's any anything to think that Joseph II was autistic in a specific sense. He obviously wasn't, he functioned in society. Um, and one can find all sorts of political reasons for his personal lifestyle, but nevertheless, I mean, there runs through his life, uh, you know, a great inability to relate to other human beings. Or well, to some extent, of course, you know, a child who is brought up, and I mean, this is really, because I do spend a bit of time talking about this, I don't have time today, but educating the heir to a throne is a mighty difficult business. Um, you know, can you imagine how you bring up someone who from almost the earliest moment of consciousness, firstly is aware that he is something completely special. With the exception of his parents, he has no other equals on earth. Um, said, say possibly the heir to an, another throne, but that he's seldom on, you know, on the scene. Um, you know, someone also from very, very early time will become aware that most people who approach him are trying to use him for their own purposes. Uh, from the parents' perspective, you know, all parents are terrified of their children's upbringing and whether the malign influences will get at them, etc. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, trying to, I mean, in the first place, it, it's crucial that, you know, the fate of the dynasty, the fate of the polity can, can, can to, to quite genuine degree, depend on this child uh, and what he becomes. You know, once he is the emperor, no human being can contradict him, nor can any human being control him unless he chooses to be controlled, you know. And it gets worse with age, you know, he might have listened to mother, he might have listened to old tutor, he might not, but he might well, but then they're dead. You know. um, so everything has got to come from within, the self-discipline, the self-control. You know, a commitment to the dynasty, commitment to the polity, a sense of responsibility to God, your ancestors, all of that is essential, you know, for someone for, for whom every luxury and vice that the world has to offer um, is his to take, you know. Um, and actually being an emperor was in general quite a, even at the best, was quite a, a grueling job. You know, it was a job. I mean, it has to be set forward. It was, of course, much more than, a, than just a normal job, but it was a job and a grueling one. Um, and yet it was a grueling job, full of responsibility and a sense of duty, if done well, uh, laid on a human being who actually, if he chose, could more or less ignore all the obligations of his office and sit in his bath with his harem. You know, I mean... So you've got all sorts of problems. So a tremendous amount of the education of an heir is, you know, trying to inculcate into him a sense of responsibility, duty, obligation, etc. And yet, of course, that's not enough. In fact, it can be counterproductive because, you know, you're bringing someone up who's got to have a very powerful sense of will. He's got to be able to manage, control, aggressive, ambitious, often ruthless human beings. Uh, so we somehow you've got to bring him up to be full of duty and responsibility to his father. Because I mean, he, the thing about, you know, the heir, um, to varying degrees, but always to some degree, he's both his father's pride and joy, 
the future of the dynasty, the father's role in eternity, he's also the biggest threat to the father. Because, you know, he is the only person around whom conspiracy can become legitimate, if you like. So, I mean, you know, it, it is an enormous, and, and the relationship between father and heir is a very, very, very interesting one. There's so all these things come in. There's one more question here, Adrian, 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 about uh, Shaliman. <laughs> Suleiman the, the Great, Suleiman yeah. the Magnet. Um, I noticed that in discussing various emperors, um, yeah. I might have missed it, but we didn't discuss a Charlemagne because no, simplistically, I, I think that Europe has been a mess since the death of Charlemagne and essentially what is now France was now Germany been fighting a battle as to sort yeah. of who yeah. basically control and the Reformation, Reformation, Counter-Reformation, the, the, the wars, um, the Great War, the, the World War, uh, Napoleon, it's all basically coming from Charlemagne, so the, the heir of, of, of Charlemagne, and, and Europe sort of sorting itself out, and, and the EU's a further example of what's the balance, and also the fear of a united Germany. You even had Margaret Thatcher um, objecting to East Germany and West Germany coming well, back together that. again. I was on a uh, foreign it, policy advice. And that goes right back to Charlemagne, I think. It, it's sort of the fear of what he created, it then broke up because he didn't sort of manage sure. the process with, the, with, with his sons. But sure. it, it, it really is the theme of Europe of 1500 years. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is, look, it, given the scale of this book, um, a lot has to be left out. I John. barely mentioned Charlemagne or the Carolingian Empire. Frankly, by the standards of the Caliphate or of the tongue, it's very brief and very sure. you know, short term. What I do do is talk about what you've just been, you know, talking about, but mostly in terms of comparison between China yeah. and Western Europe, between China and Rome, between, you know, the the two. Well, the, tr the tradition parts. which emerges yeah. in the of the of the Western end of Eurasia of multipolarity, and in Eastern Asia of empire. Yeah. So that is very much a theme in the book, but it's not really related to Charles very much, but it, that's very much in the book. But specifically Charlemagne, no. Um, but but it, as I say, it's around those themes. It's around those themes. I mean, one obvious big dis distinction is that in, um, in East Asia, spiritual and secular authority is fused in the person of the emperor. In Latin Europe, it's divided between Pope and Emperor, and both of them are elected monarchs. Yeah. That I, I was taught by I was taught by Walter Ullman when I was my time at yeah, Trinity. Yeah, yeah. It's all you know, uh, what great great greater um, uh, teacher of the difference of the empire and the papacy. Sure, sure, sure. Um, no, no, all of that's all of that's entirely true. Um, yeah. But it's you know it's a bigger issue I think frankly than just Charlemagne or the Carolingians. Yeah. Um, what I do have a chapter on is the, you know, is Charles V and Philip II yeah. as would-be European emperors and the relationship between that and the emergence of a big trans-oceanic empire. Yes, because they, they turned their attention from the Mediterranean to, to America, didn't they? And essentially yeah. Turkey turned to the Middle East and you sort of had this sort of and certainly what happened to the Mediterranean as a result of it, didn't you? It, it, it almost became like old, a no-man's I mean, land. Think, old old Piret was right. The big, the big change from the ancient world is um, the emergence of Islam and the yeah. division of, 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 of what had been a single cultural space, the Mediterranean, into a, crudely putting it, Christian North and Islamic South. Sure. You know, um, I think that, you know, that is absolutely fundamental. I mean, I... I mean, I don't think one can talk about the, the Habsburgs, you know, if you mean literally the emperors, shifting their attention to the Americas. The Americas were always a cash cow to fund what they saw as their mission, which was, you know, the defence of the Catholic Counter-Reformation and the Habsburg dynasty as legitimised and leading that um, in Europe. And the resources of the Americas had been given by God in order to secure the victory yeah. of his true faith. Of, you know, and that their sense of the way in which their dynasty's destiny 
was absolutely entangled in that of the only true faith. It's, it's completely fundamental. Yeah. No, thanks for that. Um, okay. Yeah, Dominic, I think we've been two and a half But you know, hour. Gerhard, it's not just my emperors which are universally male. So is your audience. I noticed this. I know. I you know. No women interested in, in, in empire, in, in imperial monarchy. Very sad. I'm, I'm always working very hard. I know. Oh, yes. don't you? I always have to. I try and recruit people. It can be very difficult. I had some uh, registered, actually, but they didn't. I had several. What's the matter? Oh, no importance. It's there's usually there's like two thirds of the people turn up who actually register and yes. some of them. No, that's fine. Some women registered, but they didn't appear here now. Well, apart from anything else, yeah. I mean, it's seven in the evening with you, but it's you know well, it began. But I mean, it's midday here. Yeah, people are trying to work. Uh, yes, that's one issue, of course. Yeah, it's about the time anyway. zones. Other time zones, yeah. you know. Yes. Not much really. good good but thank you so very very much not at all not at all not at all Gerhard. and i will give you a ring once i arrive touch wood fantastic yes sure yeah, yeah. yes we have I, lunch or supper or something of course all of us we can't wait for your book to come out when that should be next spring god willing as i say next i'm um, my next task is the copy editing oh, okay there yeah. are some people here who asked me that. in the chat about the title of the book and so on uh, but in I the shadow of the gods the Emperor in World History. Yeah. Okay. Penguin. Alan Lane Penguin. Thank you Good. so very, very much. Not at all, Gerhard. Bye bye to you all. Looking forward yeah. to seeing you soon. And please Good. take part in, in our other discussions. I will. Love to. Love to. And okay. as I say, my wife wants to listen to the talk on autism as well. Oh, of course. She's yeah. very welcome. We also have another one on brains. Uh, but it's uh, we haven't fixed the date now. So yeah. in that area, there's. We can talk about these things along. Yeah. Great. Bye bye. Thank you for, thank you for a you fascinating, so fascinating talk. Thank, thank you. you also thank very, you. very, very much. Most of all, Dominic, thank you so very, very much. Amazing. Not at all, not at all, yeah, Gerhard. See you soon. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you so bye much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Gerhard, for arranging for me to get on. Thank you very much indeed. Come in. Bye bye. Bye.